Hello, welcome to my talk on elementary fluid dynamics. This talk is on what are fluids and how we can study them. In this talk, I will talk about what are fluids. This would include the simple and the technical definitions for fluids. Then I move to the common properties. For fluids and the solids, and the unique properties of fluids, and lastly, I will discuss how we can study fluids or fluid dynamics, and what are the physical parameters we need to serve in fluid dynamics. In a simple definition. A fluid is the substance that flows, such as liquid, water, and gases, air, etc. Water and air are the two most important fluids in our life. Actually, we cannot live without them. We need water to cook food. We drink water. We wash. And about the sixty of our body is water. Air is the same important as water to us. We breathe air, and we need the oxygen in the air to keep our body working. But for fluid dynamics, water and air might be more than what we need to live. We also need to design ships which could travel on rivers and seas, and the airplanes which could fly in the air, etc. Thus, we need to understand better the phenomenon in what motion and air flows. If we need to design a better ship or an airplane, this. Are the fluid dynamic studies for? Let's see an experiment of flows of different material. Here we have three different materials: the flower, the fine salt, and water. The volume of each material is the same as sixty. Miniliter. The first experiment is the flow of the flower. We can see the flower flows through the funnel, but not very smooth. We have to shake the funnel to make the flower flowing. The main reason may be its lower density. Its density is 0.593 kg. Per liter, the flower flow without a sharp coin in the cup. The second experiment is the flow of the fine salt, and we can see the salt flow through the funnel is very smooth and fast, since salt has much larger density than flower, 2.16 against. 0.593 kg per liter, and the result of the salt flow in the cup is a flat coin. The third experiment is water. Obviously, water could flow through the funnel easily as we expected. The result of the water flow in the container is a flat surface. If we follow the simple definition of fluids, all these three materials are fluids. Is this true? However, the simple definition for fluid may have difficulties for some special materials. For instance, the fine granule materials. Could flow like a real fluid, 
such as the fan thought through the funnel in the photo. The granular material could flow, but they are not the flows because the granular material could form the cone shape in the container. See this picture. While for fruits, the top of the fruit in the container would be flat. While some other materials look like solid, but they are actually fruits. For instance, the peach tar, see here. And we can see here, for peach tar, can it become flat top as the water in the cup? The answer for this is because of the very, very high viscosity of the peach tar. It would take a long time to form a flat surface. Might be many years to form a flat top. Now, we look at the technical definition for a fruit. A fruit cannot sustain a tangent or a shear force when at rest and could undergo a continuous change in shape under such a stress. In other words, under shear stress, regardless how small it would be, the fruit would flow. Then, based on this definition, we can see the difference between fluids and uh, solids. Fluids can flow under applying a shear stress, but the solids cannot. Fluids have some unique properties that the solids do not have, such as pressure, viscosity, etc. We first see the common properties of fruit and the solids. Obviously, fruit and the solids both have a density, which is a property about how much mass of the material in a unit volume. For instance, the air density is 1.225 kg per cubic meter in 20 degrees, and the steel density is 7,874 kg per cubic meter. Both fluids and solids have temperature, which is a property that determines the degrees of hotness or coldness, or the level of heat intensity. We can often say the water is too hot, or when we touch a metal surface, we would say, oh, it's cold. So this phenomenon is related to the temperature of the material. Both solid and fluid are elastic media in which the sound can travel a certain distance per unit time. In the air, the speed of the sound is about 340 meters per second at about 20 degrees. And in water, the speed of sound is about 1,500 meters per second. In steel, it would be about 6,000 meters per second. And we have more common features for fluids and solids, such as the compressibility, the heat, conductivity, etc. We have also some unique properties for fluids. The first one is the fluid pressure. As I can see, what causes the fluid pressure is not very clear. This 
context is from one famous textbook. It states, the surface of a immersed body in a fruit is bombarded by a large number of fluid molecules randomly, so to create a force on the surface. Look at the picture. So the molecules would move in the fruit randomly and hit the surface of the body immersed in the fluid, so to create the pressure. Superficially, this description makes a sense for the fluid pressure. However, if we are using it to explain why the static pressure is larger in deeper water, if we have a big pressure, that means we might have more molecules deep in the water. Obviously, it's not correct. Otherwise, the density of the water in deep is larger. Or the molecules in deep water might move faster, thus cause a larger pressure. This is not correct either, because if the molecules move faster, that means the corresponding temperature of the fluid would be high. Obviously, these two are not correct. And I will talk more about fluid pressure in other talks. Here we may have questions. Do we have a pressure in solid? The answer for this is no. There is no pressure in a solid. And then what about the pressure on a solid surface? If we apply the force on the solid surface. But this is quite different from the fluid pressure definition as given here. It should be better called as the force of a unit surface. In the next two slides, the fluid static pressure will be examined for the most convenient fluid, water and air. The first example is the static pressure in water. So the pressure delta P is calculated as this. Here, rho W is the water density and the P0 is the atmospheric pressure at the sea level and G is the gravitational acceleration and H is the depth in the water. So delta P is actually the gauge pressure or the pressure we conventionally refer to which is proportional to the water depth. If we look at the static pressure in the deepest ocean, the Mariana Trench, the static pressure would be about 1,100 bars. This means an area of a square centimeter, a size of a snare. The force would be about one ton or 10,000 tons on a surface of one square meter. For your reference, the average body surface of an adult is between 1.6 to 1.9 square meters. So imagine if a human goes down to the deepest ocean, he or she would sustain a force between 16,000 to 19,000 tons acting on his or her body. In this slide, we look at the atmospheric pressure in the atmosphere. The atmospheric pressure in the atmosphere is more complicated than the pressure in water. This is the formula for calculating the atmospheric pressure in the troposphere, which is up to 11 kilometers in space, given as this. 
So if we draw the pressure against the altitude, we can see the pressure decreases with the altitude. And at the sea level, the pressure is about 100,000 pascals. Since the atmospheric pressure decreases with the altitude in the atmosphere, so for commercial flight, the flight altitude is about 11,000 meters. So the pressure would be only 22% to the pressure at the sea level. Obviously, the airplane must be pressurized for people to survive in the flight. Another interesting attitude is on the Everest, where the height is about 8,848 meters above the sea level. And the pressure on the Everest is 31% of the pressure at the sea level. Hence, for the Everest climbers, they must be trained to get used to such a low pressure. The second unique property of fluids is viscosity. Viscosity is the result of the fluid molecules interactions for a tendency to resist sliding between the layers in fluids. See these two layers sliding each other and the viscous force would be created to resist the sliding of the fluid CF and F prime. Now we look at a situation. We apply a shear stress tau on a solid element, the rectangle. Because of the applied shear stress, there might be a limit deformation of the element. And at the same time, the element of the solid would produce a counter stress tau prime at this. And when tau equaling to tau prime, the deforming of the element would stop. Hence, we can see for the solid, there will be no flow, no viscosity. However, if we apply the shear stress on the element of a fluid, then there will be a sliding of the fluid. C at the time T1, the dashed red line, and at the time T2, the deformation of the element is the green dashed line. And uh, at the time T3, the blue dashed line. Thus, we can see a continuous deformation under a shear stress on a fluid element. This is a flow. Because of the sliding of the fluid, there will be viscous force to resist the sliding. And for air, the viscosity mu is 1.8 times 10 power of minus 5. Newton second per square meter. And the water, the viscosity is 10 power of minus 3. And we put the temperature here because the viscosity would be very dependent on the temperature. How we can calculate or define the viscosity we can based on Newton's law of viscosity given as this tau 12 is the shear stress. It is defined as the limit of the expression as this. And uh, it can be written as this. Here, partial differentiation is used because the velocity component u could be also the function of x and z. The partial differentiation of u with regard to y means 
the differentiation is calculated when x and z are kept unchanged. However, if u is the function of y only, as seen in this plot, then the partial differentiation of u with regard to y is the same as the normal differentiation of u with regard to y given at this. And the Newton's law of viscosity is a way for defining the dynamic viscosity mu if we can measure the shear stress tau 12 and the partial differentiation of u with regard to y. The unit of the dynamic viscosity is given as this and this. Another important fluid viscosity called climatic viscosity. It is given as nu equaling to mu divided by rho. This viscosity has a unit of meter squared per second. In this slide, the viscosities for the conventional fluids are given here, including air, water, milk, cream, oil, honey, sour cream, this column for the density and this column for the dynamic viscosity mu. This viscosity is the direct viscosity for the fluid. If we compare the water and the honey, we can see the thickness of the water and the honey would be different. We can feel the significant difference of the thickness between water and honey. And for kinematic viscosity, it's more related to the fluid dynamics and the motions. And uh, we can see here, although water has a larger dynamic viscosity than air, the kinematic viscosity of the water is smaller than air. And from this table, we can see water has the lowest kinematic viscosity and the very high climatic viscosity for honey, mayonnaise, and sour cream. For practical applications, sometimes we need to find a smaller climatic viscosity for the fluids, such as for the wind tunnel test, where we need to create a large Nanos number. But from this table, we can see the water has the lowest climatic viscosity. If we compare water to mercury, and uh, we can see the dynamic viscosity of mercury is very close to the water. The climatic viscosity of mercury is much smaller than water, but mercury is not a good fluid for doing the test. Therefore, we normally try to find a different way to solve the problem. I will talk this problem in different talks. Now, in the next few slides, we will look how we can start fluid mechanics. The first slide is on the fluid mechanics for liquid, especially for water. We have two different topics on this. One is hydrodynamics. This is from Daniel Brody's book, Hydrodynamica, published in 1738. Now, hydrodynamics normally means the theoretic or analytic method to start fluid dynamics. So this includes the analytic solutions for example, for the simple laminar flows, laminar boundary layers, potential flows. This is for inviscid flows, including Bernoulli's equation, wave theory, 
wave structure interactions, hydrofoils, and etc. And the CFD, computational fluid dynamics, for all viscose flows. The other topic is the hydraulics. This is from John Bernoulli's book Hydraulica, published in 1743. Now, hydraulics normally means the experiment or empiric method to start fluid dynamic problems. This is especially focused on pipe flows in water supplies, water pumping, and hydropower. Open channel flows include rivers, open channels. Now also use computational fluid dynamics for studying all these problems. We have also the topics for air and gases. Aerodynamics is especially for air motions and force. This covers all theoretical and experimental studies of the fluid dynamics for air, including the analytic solutions, simple laminar flows, laminar boundary layers, potential flows for airfoils with kuta rukovsky theorem, inviscid flows for subsonic and supersonic flows, Bernoulli's equations, and the experiment studies for all real air flows, the wind tunnel test and the field test, and the now very popular method CFD for all viscose flows. And we may also occasionally see the topic called gas dynamics. This is especially for studying gases. But the method would be almost the same as in aerodynamics. It is hardly to be regarded as a branch in fluid dynamics. In the last slide, I will talk about what are the physical parameters in fluid dynamics. Although the fluid dynamics problems are very complicated, if we look at what are the physical parameters we are trying to serve, it is actually very simple. The primary parameters include the fluid pressure, P, and the fluid velocity, the vector V, or the component of the velocity Vx, Vy, and Vz. And if we can obtain these parameters, then we can calculate all the forces, moments, flow the fields, the main features of the fluid motion. And we may serve for other parameters, include the fluid density, the fluid temperature, and these are especially for studying compressible air, shock wave, and heat transfer, etc. So if we look at these parameters we are trying to serve for fluid dynamics, it seems they are not very complicated. But in fact, it is very complicated if we are trying to serve all these parameters, especially when the flows are turbulent.